Absolutely. And I think Absolutely. they've perfected it in Japan. And it's like culturally ingrained in them. Like it's, it's, it's part of their culture. Like if you're going to do something, you're going to do it all in. And if you want to get better, it's, you know, all or nothing. And Hey y'all, welcome back to When the Cleats Come Off. We have a returning guest back on the show. Natasha Watley is here. So happy to have you here. Yes, I am happy to be back. I mean, last time I felt like we needed more time. So I'm excited that we get to continue the conversation. <laughs> Me too. I agree with that completely. I remember we had like five minutes left and I was like, what? I still have 45 questions on my page. <laughs> We need to do this again. Um, and ironically, we're doing this while you're while you're in Japan again. Yeah. So early morning for you, late night for me. Um, <laughs> but just so grateful that you could be back. Um, last time we we dove like really hard into slapping um, and just being we we talked a little bit about base running, but not a whole lot. Um, definitely want to dive into that with you today because you and I both know how important good base running is. Um, and how it's definitely not taught as much as it should be. We both even just kind of hinted that we need to develop courses around this yep, yep. because it's it's something that I think everybody can learn from. Like whether you're just starting out or playing college, like it's yeah. you can never you can never know too much, you know. Right, right. And there's always new things to learn, and I think a lot of things too. It comes from just instinctual things as well, you know, when it comes to base running, and so once you start to put like the strategy behind it and you start to practice that way, it's a game changer for people. I, and I think that's where, where we see base running mistakes is like the strategy is not instilled. So they don't build the instincts, you know? So um, yeah, there's so, there's so many things. Yeah. I mean, so many things that we can talk about. Sure, I know, I know. And we're probably going to talk about that the longest, but I did want to dive into your experience in Japan. So last time we asked your, your story of your playing career and you got to play until how old until you, when you retired 35 35 yeah and you played the majority of that was well actually you played in Japan and the U.S. together yeah. mm -hmm. um yes and you were very successful in both places um but just after coming off the Olympics I mean it was this past summer and I'm very curious how like if you can just, you know, wrap it up in like one to two minutes spiel on like, what was your take from, from Tokyo 2020 seeing, seeing how the U S the U S turned out, how Japan turned out and maybe just holistically, what, what's your take on it? Um, I'm just, I'm just interested in what you thought. Oh gosh. I had like a whole realm of emotions. And if anybody caught my little rant on social media, I was super emotional and I was like mad at myself that I was emotional but emotional because there's for, on so many levels. I mean, the main thing, obviously, just relating to our USA athletes and their feeling of feeling like they let our country down, you know, winning silver. And, you know, I've won a silver medal as well. And you have this feeling of like disappointment. And, and as you should, I mean, you lost, you lost the gold medal game, you know, but I think when you start to separate and you get away it's still, you won a medal and so yeah. many people can't say that, you know? And so, um, I felt that that was the immediate, the next thing was obviously, you know, I think, you know, my opinion, and, and I think for, that's why you asked this in my opinion, that is why I think the Japanese were able to pull through is they have a successful pro league, the athletes that are on that national team, they're training 100 and 100% of the 365 days of the year, they probably mm -hmm. get, you know, a couple of days off here and there, but they're training at a high competitive elite level with their pro teams. And I'm just jealous. And, you know, yes, I'm here. Um, it's been my full-time job. Um, they allowed me to extend my career. And so, you know, there's other factors to that, but I, you know, I so badly want this at home and we have yet to like figure it out. And so mm -hmm. I do think that that was very, that exposed USA in terms of talent, player for player, the depth of players that we have at home far exceed the talent that they have here. You know, I'm here, I'm hands-on here, you know, they're great, they're good, but they consistently are training, they're consistently doing things. And, you know, we're putting a team together that 
yeah, they're training together for a year or a year or two outside of the Olympics, but they're outside of that, you know, where, where are they getting better? Where are they developing, you know, athletes that have been, that have come out of college on our USA team and that are on the national team when they leave the USA team, like where, where are we making them better at, you know? And so like that part, that hurt, um, that hurts, you know? And so like, you know, there's a need there. So that was another emotion. And the last emotion is just, you know, being a part of the game and just, you know, building friendships internationally. Um, my friends that are here in Japan, Australia, um, seeing some of the greats that are going to retire, knowing that our game won't be in the next Olympics. The only next shot is 2028. And so like just seeing that another gap and like just hoping that we don't take a step back and like there's just so much momentum and so much excitement that was built around just getting to 2020, you know, and like how excited our game was across the world, you know, feeling that here in Japan, feeling that at home, other countries as well. And so like that was the, the other part of just seeing some of my friends retire, you know, Stacy Porter, a competitor I've played with for like the last 15 years, you know, mm -hmm. I have built a friendship with her playing against her here in Japan. Um, knowing that she's not going to put an Australian uniform on, um, bueno, you know, not that I said that we, I can't say we built a friendship, but we've built a rapport of, you yeah. know, like we see each other, it's respect, you know, and I respect that girl's game madly. You know, I, I, I think she's one of the best pitchers I've ever faced and to to know possibly we won't see her in 2028. It's like we watched history. So like that, those were like all my emotions that were going through. And it was like, mm -hmm. I, I felt it and I, I was embarrassed that I posted it, but then I was like, you know what? Like I feel this and I'm putting this out there. And I really, I was, I was, I was a wreck that next day, you know, and it wasn't about me. It was just my pure relationship to the game. And, um, that was it. Was yeah. <laughs> I felt, I felt every emotion simply because yeah. I started crying, literally watching you put, like yeah. put this up. It was in your stories. <laughs> um, I'm not exaggerating. I literally started to tear up because you want it so bad because you played on team USA. You wanted them to win so badly. And it, you, you probably foresee, like you want the U S to do the things that Japan is doing because they earned it. Like they flat out they earn the dang gold. And as hard as it is to say, like the U S has, has, I don't want to say a long way to go. Cause I think we have, like, we've done a good job to be able to develop players to play, you know, and they still beat them in the first game. So clearly we have a lot of great things going on, but I completely agree. And, and you told me just before this, this is your 13 in Japan for you. Like you have seen the Japanese compete and play um, you've played there. Um, I, I played with, um, Yamada and, uh, Watsonabe, like uh, Kazuki. And I, when I played with them, I learned so much in such a fast amount of time. I played with them for one year and I'm sitting there listening to stories and they're like, yeah, we practice six hours a day. It's like, that's yeah. just yeah. day in the life. We, we practice all year. Um, yep. we literally are employees of, I think they both played for Toyota at the time. Um, and it, it just really opened my eyes to this whole nother world that I don't think many know about. So that's why I asked you back on is because if anybody knows that world, um, especially compared to ours, you, you know, um, what works. So could you just like start us out with maybe your experience there? Cause I know, I think it was, was it when you won silver was maybe the first time you went over, um, yep. Yeah, guide us through that journey of how you just started to to play there and just fall in love with that culture. Yeah. So right after 2008, um, I just I'm like I'm not done yet. <laughs> I still want to play. Um, and at that time, we knew that we weren't going to be back in the 2012 Olympics um, or 16. So it's like I'm not ready to hang these cleats up. You know, we still had you know, the pro league, and I knew that I could do that, but I wanted that opportunity to play year round. And so I was 27 at the time. So that was after 2008, 27. And that was my first year um, here in Japan. And honestly, I was like, I'll just go for one year and just test it out and just see how it goes. Never in a million years dreamt of like living and being in Japan. Mm -hmm. um, but when I reached out, you know, the only team that I could get a hold of or reach out to was Toyota. And they're like, okay, we would love to have you, but we're not going to sign you until we find a pitcher. So I'm like, if you can help us find a pitcher, then we'll take you. So I'm like, 
well, shoot, you know? So if I'm going to find a pitcher, I'm going to go find the best darn pitcher there is, you know? And so uh, I'm, yeah. like, <laughs> and I'm like, Hey, Monica, you know, like, let's go play for Toyota. And she's like, Oh my gosh, I've got so many offers from so many different Japanese teams. I'm like, okay, well, choose Toyota, like, <laughs> you know, yeah. more so, you know, she's a pitcher and she was, you know, they were all after her as they should. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm like, choose Toyota, you know, and luckily I think she chose Toyota and I think partly, you know, we know that name in at home, you know, most of the other teams she hadn't heard of. And, um, I would like to say I played a small part, but I'm, you know, knowing one because she made her decision diligently, um, but made the decision to come. And I mean, it was just life changing. I think it changed our world, it, especially after, you know, in our brains, we lost a gold medal. So I'm like, you know, I'm going to go and I'm going to learn like why these girls, why these women beat us, you know, what is it that they're doing here that we're not? Um, so I came with like open eyes, an open mind. Like I'm not going to, you know, be, you know, like be stuck up or I'm going to do everything. Like, and, Mm -hmm. um, I fell back in love with the game. Like, not that I had fallen out of the love and I I should say I got re-inspired. Um, they these this team that we came to like when we came to Toyota they were like seventh eighth place there's 12 teams in Japanese pro league and they just opened up opened and welcomed welcomed us with open arms and Mm -hmm. um more you know like they just were grinding and they were we spoke a universal language of like competing and winning you know we couldn't really necessarily compete Um, so that one year turned into two and that two turned into three and then like it just kept rolling and we just kept coming back and that first year we lost the championship game we first time our team ever made it to the championship game lost the championship game to Wayno's team who is like the long-standing like champs right Um, and then after the second year we came back we actually we won and so from then I think we were kind of hooked and just built this relationship with this this Toyota team and they've become family um, so have seen the league evolve. I mean, back then it was like only Wayno's team and, um, Toyota Shoki, which was Michelle Smith's team. Like that were the top two teams, Michelle Smith. I think we missed her by a year or two. Um, she had just retired. And so, um, once we came, like, then there was like three, four, five teams that were like, you know, competing, um, for a championship every single year. So we could just see the growth of just like, it just always just being these two teams to now like the wealth being spreaded against uh, across different teams and just seeing how they've developed. Um, and it's because it's the consistency of the amount of times that they get to train, um, the support, um, you know, they, the league is fully supported by these corporations these corporations just it's a line item in their budget and they dish out money to support these teams and develop these women um they pour into their athletes and it's not about making money it's about purely developing their athletes and where they make their money is that these women are employees of the company and so you know when they're not on the field they're working for the company making money for the company so that's kind Mm -hmm. of like a payback you know and so it makes sense Um, And as a team, you know, gets better and like, as we started to prove ourselves, our girls, you know, they have kind of levels within the company. So if like you're a B level, like you work a little bit more at the company and then like you practice less, but like they've earned because we started to win that A level where now they, they're purely like just practice, you know, and like maybe um, have to check in once a week with their companies. And so they're not really working all that much. Um, because they earned it, you know? And so it's mm-hmm. just a really neat model, um, how they get incentivized, you know, and they, and they get to get paid to play like essentially, and it's cool. And so when they retire, they have a job to fall back into. They go and they work for the company if they choose. Um, it's just a really unique situation. Um, I love it. I love it. I love it here. <laughs> That's a long winded. Yeah. So. I can tell, I can tell you love it there. Now, when did their league, I, I don't know if you know this answer, but when did it begin? Do you know any idea? Yeah, I do know. And I just actually asked this question. Um, I want to say in, um, I want to say like the, like nineties. Um, oh, really? I, I, yeah. Don't quote me. I, I just asked this question. I can get back to you on that, but yeah, I mean, before us, like Lisa Fernandez played for Toyota, um, Susie Para, Gillian Box. 
Um, so the league has been around for quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to say like nineties. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I, I really just wanted to know that question because growing up as I, I was born in 93, I don't want to date anyone here, but I was born in 93 and had in my entire career, even like until probably my junior year of college, I had no idea there was a pro softball league. Yeah. I had no idea in the U S. Um, And because of like you were saying, like the different tiers that they have, just the system, the organization that they have in Japan, you make it seem like they've been around for a hundred years, like that league, you know? Um, But their model is just, it's incredible. It's it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, They Mm -hmm. clearly have tons of money um, just because of the corporation they are under. Um, And I know a lot of people want, you know, pro softball to be combined with the MLB, which there's money there too. But like just the way Japan is doing it, so different. It's so it's different. It's so different in because the, the intent is not return on investment. And, you know, and I think that's a big thing at home. Anybody who wants to jump into a pro league, like it's like, what's my return on this investment? Right. Um, and they have built it on the merit of like the intent is to develop our athletes and give them full support year round. It's dope. It's dope. <laughs> it's so cool. Yeah. It's so cool. And just to have that support and it's like now, but so, you know, things will, and we can get into that. Things will change next year. They're rebranding the, the whole league, adding teams and like they're changing the model to build revenue because now they've built a runway. They've built fans, they've built support. They have the teams, um, so next year will be interesting in 2022, um, the league will restructure and change. And I think they're gonna have some built-in revenue models, but that's that hasn't been the case until, uh, until up to date, which is pretty darn cool. Yeah, yeah. And just for anybody that's listening, that's just like, what? There's but like yeah. pro, and like Michelle Smith played over there, like you played over there. Yes, mm-hmm. like these elite players in the US, in order to make, I'm just going to say it six figures and like, and actually what they deserve at the highest level, they're going to Japan to do so. Um, and, and if I remember correctly, the teams have at, or there's like a max of like two other foreign players per team. Correct. So each team can have two foreigners right now in this current league, which will change. There's 12 teams. And there's a first division and a second division. And in the first, you know, our Toyota teams in the first division, then there's 12 teams. Um, not sure how many, in the, I think there's less teams in the second division. Two foreigners per each team. But next year, when the model changes, they will have 16 teams. They'll have the East and the West division and it's unlimited amount of foreigners that no way. have in the team. So it's, it's, it's awesome. So it's yeah. pretty much based on that team's budget on, how many foreigners they can bring. They're really trying to make it a true pro league. And the way that they label the existing pro league is it's a semi pro league, so it's not fully pro. So now they're trying to change the model to like, it's a full pro league, bring in athletes. Like we want this, they want this to be the best pro league in the world. Mm. That's what they said, like that's their marketing. And um, it's kind of exciting. It's, 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 it's exciting and crazy. And it's like, at the same time, it's like, we got to figure it out at home too. Yeah. And, and honestly, like looking at it from afar, that's going to provide so many more opportunities. I feel like for USA players at this point, you know, I mean, if you're going to compete at the highest level, I, I do love athletes unlimited. Like I love the premise. I love that. Um, athletes are getting more. I mean, just this past week, I launched an episode with Lauren Hager and we talked about our pro experience and how different it is now with athletes unlimited and how great that is. But I think Mm -hmm. it's just so cool that, you know, an athlete can really, you know, make this full time because a lot of people don't last in the U S simply because they can't do this full time unless they get, you know, tons of sponsors. Um, and even then it's like, where do you train? How do you train? It's, there's just no like full system that's yeah. as incredible as Japan. So yep. I, I'm, I want to dive into like practice and what yep. the year looks like. So you're over yep. there coaching now. So you, yep. you've seen it from both ends. So I'm excited yes. to ask you these questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but can you just describe maybe what like a week looks like for a typical team? Like, let's just say you're, um, 
you know, maybe preseason looks different than season. I'm just interested to know what, what is your maybe year or weeks look like? Um, yeah. So the season is broken up into two halves um, okay. and then they do that to accommodate the national team because the national team plays in the summer. So every, remember everything's intentful. So the league was mm-hmm. built to build their national team. You know, it's the teams, the pro teams are national, uh, actual feeders to um, the national team. That's how they pick their athletes. And so there's three months in the spring, three months in the fall. So it usually starts mid April or, you know, first or second week of April goes all the way till June. They break for the summer and then they come back at the end of um, August, start early September, October, November, the final tournament playoffs are usually in the first or second week of November. And then that's their whole season. Um, As a player, you know, obviously I had to be here way more um as an athlete um you know obviously my contract as a coach I'm like a specialized coach and I just work with some hitters and and do some stuff offensively mainly um so as a player you know I was I would come probably mid-march and train for two or three weeks prior to our opening um and then we would start mid-april and we would go and there usually the games are back to back. There'll be, you know, sometimes there'll be a week or two off, but our practices on a game week are definitely different than when it's like an off week or preseason. Um, we in preseason, definitely we're doing AM PM training. We like that six to seven hours is not a joke that you're talking about because if you're Yamada, like they really practice all day long. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like a job. The, yeah, it's it, well, you're getting paid to to play, right? Right. And so, in preseason, usually, I mean, we get there at nine, and we'll go from like nine to eleven thirty, um, do some sort of defense, um, and then in the um, afternoon, it's all hitting, and probably start around one thirty two. So from like two to like four thirty, it's um, you know front toss. You know, we'll do. Um, drills or whatnot and then we'll get into some type of live hitting or situational hitting depending on like where we are and then after that it is like custom that they practice on their own so like after 4 30 team practice is done so probably like from 5 to 6 37 they'll do just their individual training where they'll get extra ground balls do extra hitting but it's like ingrained in their blood so it's like 100% 100% of the team usually is staying at that time. Wow. That's a it's testament amazing. to just like how much they want to get better. Like, it's like, they don't do it because they're, they're forced to do it. They literally do it because they're like, okay, I learned this during practice. Now let's go like do yeah. it. Let's yeah. execute it. I love yeah. that. That's cool. It's crazy. And it'll be funny because like in the spring, when we come, there'll be like a, a freshman athlete, you know, her first year. And it's like, okay, she's kind of good, like interesting that they got her, you know, but we'll see, Mm -hmm. you know, we'll come back in this, in the fall and, um, after the summer and like completely a different athlete just changed because of how much work and time is put in from when we saw them in the spring until when they come back because they're working and the improvement is visible. Like, it's like, usually you see these changes like year to year for a college athlete, like these these changes are visual from like month to month because of how much they, they train. It's, it's ridiculous. It's crazy. Um, and I'm sure yeah. people would say that about you too. Like, oh gosh. You, cause you don't see it, but like, I guarantee you go to Japan. So you, you see people in the U S and they're like, where'd she learn that skill? Like what? <laughs> She's got another thing. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's just, it's amazing. Like just being able to have that time. And then in a, um, league week, our practices are cut a little bit shorter. So like Monday is usually typically a day off. Tuesday, we'll have like an AM PM training. Wednesday will just only be AM only. And then Thursday, they'll just hit only um, in the morning. And then they usually, it's travel day and Mm. they'll travel to their venues. And the way that Japan League is, it's everybody plays at a neutral site. So there'll be three sites, four teams travel to each site. And then um, Friday, you get to practice on the game field that you um, travel to and then games are Saturday, Sunday. So you have one game Saturday, one game Sunday, and then repeat. Um, So kind of the flow, it goes um, time and it's just full on training and support uh, throughout the season. So it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. I was interested to see if they had like home fields, but I kind of like the idea of a a neutral site. Um, It just makes it fair. Um, Yeah. 
But speaking of neutral sites, a lot of people were upset during the Olympics. I wasn't planning on asking this, um, but a lot of people were upset that they changed sites. Um, why? <laughs> I don't. I don't know why. I, I don't know why. But I do remember that being some sort of like an issue. Like people were like wondering, you know, why would they move? Why are they so far away from like everything? Um, yeah. And COVID was a big issue. I mean, like they they had to they had to go about those rules. But do you remember that being a thing? at all i mean yeah a couple people wrote me like why did they change and the reason why they started so far away was because when the earthquake happened that was they're they're playing near in fukushima that was remember a couple years ago 2010 i want to say it was when that big earthquake happened it was kind of uh like restoring the community there of just ele- allowing them to be a part of the olympic movement and oh, so had that cool. stadium there so it was like trying to spread the wealth as much as they could within Japan, you know, like, um, yeah. showing, you know, like we survived, um, this earthquake, you know, we're still here, please, we welcome you, um, into our community. And it was just trying to build the wealth. Um, and then, so like for the championship, they moved the, ch- the championship or the medal rounds were all played in the center of like Tokyo and Yokohama, like where all the, um, other Olympics, festivities were at so they got to play the medal rounds there um just the um beginning stages were were played pretty far I'm glad you mentioned that because that was enlightening I had no idea either and I knew you'd be the perfect one to ask but how cool like this is this is why I'm falling in love with Japanese culture just because they like they it's bigger picture I feel like it's always bigger picture for them always bigger picture, always perspective, always intentful, always mindful, always detailed. Yeah. It's, it is, I've learned so much being here of just, I mean, of like, not just the things that we focus on and, um, their ability to think of others and to think of like, how can this make the bigger picture better? they're amazing. Nobody does it better. <laughs> we can learn so much from them on how they do things um, intently um, to really benefit and support for positive reasons. Um, it's it's amazing. Yeah. And I don't think any other culture respects the game, you know, baseball or softball like them, like this, the mad, I mean, it's showing the game respect by staying after for an hour, an hour and a half to get as good as you can. Mm-hmm. Like, I think, I can think there's a lot we can learn because I know there's a lot of parents that even ask me and maybe I've asked you before, like, how do I get my daughter motivated, you know, to, to be as good as I can be at this game. And a part of it's just like, see the game as almost this grand, beautiful thing that you get to do. Mm -hmm. And like becoming as good as you can at that game is Mm -hmm. an art Mm -hmm. and it needs to be practiced. Mm -hmm. And that's how you become the best version of yourself. Absolutely. And I think they've perfected it in Japan. And it's like culturally ingrained in them. Like it's, it's, it's part of their culture. Like if you're going to do something, you're going to do it all in. And if you want to get better, it's, you know, all or nothing. And I mean, that is like the biggest thing that I've learned. It's like, you know, if I'm going to do something, I got to go all in, I got to do it, you know? And so, um, I think, I don't know that's it's exactly why they get better is because they take ownership in terms of like their own destiny of you know the only way I'm going to get better is if I stay here and turn we got to turn the field lights on you know there's there's a will there's a way you know and it's 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 proof it's I've seen I've seen it live Mm -hmm. yeah you have uh and I I really want to know what are your top reasons why they have been so dominant at least on the national stage, like what are things that you notice that maybe you haven't shared yet that you're like, these are key reasons why they are so good other than that, yeah. because that's obviously a big reason. <laughs> yeah. I mean, besides them having the opportunity to train, you know, year round playing competitively. Um, I mean, obviously that the, the model was smart. I mean, they brought in foreign athletes, you know, being, bringing in like a Monica Abbott, um, a Michelle Smith, like that raised the level and the bar of like expectations of like where they needed to reach, um, you know, and you know, it's obviously beneficial for Monica and Michelle to be here because they get to train and get to pitch, you know, all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the Japanese athletes, it was allowing them to raise their bar. Um, I think 
there, I, I mean, I mean, just in terms of them culturally, I, I think what we just talked about, their attention to detail, um, their, you know, willingness to, to get better. I think that's played a big, huge part of it. But I, I think the main reason is that they, they're fully supported as athletes where they can train. And I think that's, to me, that's like the biggest reason why they've been able to be successful on the national level. Um, yeah. yeah, that's a, that's a huge thing. And it made me think of, you know, you, you I've talked to enough people and know enough people in the game or any sport for that matter. And when you're surrounded by people or just an environment that no matter what you are put first, you Mm -hmm. and what you want, your goals become my goals. And like, Mm -hmm. how can we help you get there? How can we make sure you feel comfortable where you're at and are just served at the highest level? You play to the highest level. I mean, that's why, you know, frankly, I think college athletics is college softball is where it's at because those athletes are tended to, you know, not just academically, but also with, you know, the best, um, you know, just academic advisors, the Mm -hmm. field, um, mm-hmm. the turf management, like ours at Purdue was just like unreal. And it's just like, mm-hmm. you're around people that support the crap out of you. And it's like, how can you not want to do it for them? How can you not want to yeah. play so yeah. well for them? And, and yeah. frankly, I don't see that. I haven't, I haven't seen that in the U S as much as I wish for the pro level. Um, you know, even AU, I went to, I went to athletes unlimited and again, like where it is, where it is now compared to where it was, is it's, it's bigger, it's better. Um, uh, and, and they are served well, they're served better than we were. Um, yeah. but even then I'm like, there weren't many people in the crowd. I mean, it was yeah. cat's last game and it wasn't sold out. And I'm sitting here like, why is it not sold out? Like yeah. I'm, I came to this game to watch cat compete one more time. And I don't know, I think just culturally, again, we have so far to go, yeah. but, but I think it comes down to that. Like the yeah. fact that Japan, they, they're surrounded by the best. They, yeah. They are going to get, they're going to get the support from not just the fans, but the organizations that, that run the ship for them. Um, and they're going to, they're going to be served at the highest level, which I think is great. And, and I will say athletes in limited, I've talked to some of the players, they have been served better there than, oh, for sure. than they have in the past. And I think that that's a testament to why we're watching some of the best softball on TV. Um, I don't even know where I'm going with that, but I think it's just, I think it's just big, the environment yeah. that you're, that you're in and yeah. the support, like you play higher if you're supported. Well, exactly. Exactly. It, it's exactly, it's exactly it. It's just, it's, it's facts, you know, if you're supported and you feel empowered to really just dive into training and not have to worry about anything else. It's a beautiful thing. Like, I, I mean, I felt that like being able to play here, but mm-hmm. like at 27, I got better because I was able to just come here and just really just like be fully supported and not have to worry about keeping my lights on at home because I was getting paid, you know, and like, I just really got to train. Um, and you know, it's just, it's more than that. You know, I, I really got to get better. You know, I got to practice hitting an inside pitch every single day, you know? And Mm so I don't know, something to be said about that. Yeah. Yeah, there is. And if you're, if you're even, even just having strength and conditioning coaches, like even having just I remember playing and we didn't have strength and conditioning coaches. So I was just like calling up my buddy, my old coach from college. Like, can you help me? Like, how much should I pay you? Yeah. The all around thing. And like, just like our setup here, you know, just like exactly what you're saying, like just strength and conditioning. Um, We have like a data room, like, you know, like we have, there's a hired data analysis that we have where she goes in like the you know, scout the other teams, but we can like see our own, you know, our own swings. We can see the opposing pitcher that we're going to face for that week. Um, that's also something that mentioned too, is like our meetings on like our opponents and stuff too, but all of that is built in here. So, you know, it's like a one-stop shop. I can, you know, have all the data analysis. I can get my strength and conditioning. We have hired trainers. So if I need to get treatment or care on my body, that's built in don't have to go to, you know, like a clinic or something like, you know, when I'm at home and I had some things, issues going on, I have to like find a, a nearby clinic, you know, and like get some work done. Um, just all of that, you know, and I don't know, it's, we, we need, we need it badly at home. That's it. Yeah. 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 
How do you think yeah. we'll get there? <laughs> How do you huh? think we'll get there? What What is your What's your idea? Ideal scenario for getting there. Ideal scenario. I. I mean, I get so much pushback on this, but I, I mean, honestly, if we can like find corporations who are willing to support, like I said, on the intent of pure development, and maybe it's a line item in their budget, and maybe it's, you know, their social impact work, you know, it's not something that they're going to get an ROI right away. Um, I think we can build and, you know, I really think like on the pro level, you know, our models that we've created we try to tiptoe around the college game which we should I mean it's like it's this like sustained model that happens from February to what you know June but if we could start to you know have teams that are still together during those times and playing ex exhibition games and like those preseason college tournaments like if we can build a model that's year round um, and it's not just summer focused you know I think you know maybe it's you know not full it's maybe a preseason for the app the pro league in the spring mm -hmm. and then I think summer is actual season so we, we get some of those um, graduating um, seniors once they finish and then they like roll right into seasons with their teams in the summer and they kind of flow into the fall um, but you know at least if you are a one year two year three year removed athlete from college you're still getting that training from february to june june with your teams playing exhibition games or you're already assigned to a team you have that full support you have all the things i mentioned you have you know your data analysis your trainer strength and conditioning you're doing all those things um, leading up to a june thing so i think in terms of like model like that's what i see in terms of support if we can find um, businesses corporations um, you know, I know obviously we have some things popping up. We've got like the WPF that was just announced and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> no, I love it. I love hearing your intake. I love hearing <laughs> because, because you've seen both sides and I think yeah. just, well, one, you should be on every committee possible, um, <laughs> going on over here. Um, but it is, it is interesting to see what will happen. I do think like for those of you that are like, oh my gosh, should I, should I let my daughter dream to play pro? Yes. Yes. Yeah, totally. I mean, you just mentioned that, you know, even if it, if it stays where it is, which is a good place in the U S like, I think it's going to grow. Um, but now there's more opportunities in Japan, which I think, like you're saying, we're talking about like the culture and how, how different the game is. It's, it's a lot that girls could look forward to, yeah. um, and dream yeah. of. Yeah. It's going to be interesting this next year too, which, which with the, um, you know, with that, the WPF that was just launched with that model and the schedule that does allow for athletes to play in both. And so, which is cool, but I, I you know, I, I would love for us to get to a point where we're competing with that Japan schedule where, you know, it's not just offered in the summertime and obviously those things take time. And obviously I think starting small is a smart thing to do. But like in my perfect world, I would want an athlete to be able to have an opportunity to, to play and train um, throughout the year and not just those three months in the summertime. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, in my mind, it's a proven, it's a proven model here in Japan. Why mm -hmm. these athletes develop. Yeah. 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 And I know a lot of people that play pro. I mean, even, even I was in these shoes. I was like, well, my only option to play pro is to coach in college. So I have access to the great facilities. Yeah. Um, yeah. but yeah, I'm, I'm really interested to see where we go with this and I really love your intake on it. Um, flipping the script a little bit. Uh, I remember when I, when I, when I played with, um, Yamada and Kazuki, uh, it was, it was so funny. They literally did front toss into a net. This is just insane. Or actually they did front toss on a field without a net mm -hmm. and they worked so much on barrel control. Like literally, I think like Yama would be in the batter's box and Kazuki would be like throwing her a pitch from just like probably in line with like where the shortstop is like right. literally right in front of her face throwing this and Yama's like hitting these balls in the outfield up the middle yeah. just working yeah. on like pulling the ball and I'm like first of all don't do this at home people <laughs> <laughs> like don't try this at home um yeah. but like how serious did they take barrel control over there just because like I know I could just see it on their faces like that they take that to a level I've never seen. 
Yeah. Well, they're um, attention to detail again, like, and they're able to be like precise. They, they practice with such precision. Like that's normal. Like they do those, the little side toss thing without a net. Um, it's amazing. It's like, honestly, just amazing. Like their skill set. Um, but they practice that daily, you know, it's, it, yeah. I, see, I see it all the time, you know, so they have barrel control. They're just so into their mechanics and their fundamentals and like breaking it down and like almost to the part where it makes you sick. I'm like, Oh my gosh, just like, just, we got to compete at some point, you know, but yeah. Just, like, aren't you tired of this yet? Yeah. Yeah. There's, but they're so aware of their bodies and yeah movements and the things that they're doing they're like constantly like feeling themselves you know like terms of like trying to feel where their hands were and um I think that was that was something that I you know had to pick up on is like okay like exactly like what is it that I do you know because I you know I'm just like let's I smell blood let's compete let's go you know so totally attention um, to detail is huge what are some like little drills that you see them doing um that are just like kind of simple to describe, but also like they literally do this every day. Like, I want to know the things that you, you want to like throw up thinking about, cause they do it so much. Like, mm-hmm. what is it that they're spending a lot of time on and like, how do they do it? I think it's the side toss, the side toss. Um, that's, they do that all the time. Like, well, they, that's part of like their T workout, like their T warmups. They'll hit off the T's and then they'll move the T and then they'll have someone toss to them. And it's like, you know, super close and they'll just change the angle. So they'll like, you know, kind of be like an outside pitch and then they'll change from the other side where they're coming from the inside and they're having to like stay inside to the right side. So that helps them. If that makes any sense at all, I don't know if that made sense. It does um, to me. I hope it does to listeners. I think it, yeah, I think so it the, does. The tosser is yeah. essentially moving, you know, the, yeah. the, the head is not moving. So, mm-hmm. you know. And you can do yeah. that with a net in front of you, everybody. Like if you're a parent yeah. or a coach, that's just like, yeah. okay. I think yeah. that's huge because you have to be able to see balls come from different directions anyway, right. um, especially at the highest level. Um, yeah. I remember in college, we used to do like a, our front tosser would be, you know, way inside, like throwing at an angle and then way outside throwing at an angle. And I think even that I haven't really seen, you know, most people get their ideas from videos on YouTube. It's not really, you don't really find that anywhere, but yeah that's something huge that you can work on, especially just tracking the ball, make, letting it get to you, working to the mm-hmm. side that it's coming from or doing what you want to do. Like you said, body awareness. I think mm-hmm. that is massive. And I'm sure they do tons of other things like that um, d- defensively too. Defensively, like, and I think more so it's in the off seasons that they do more drills. So I, you know, I'm not always here during off season as much, but to be honest, they don't really do a lot of drills once we're in season. It's more reps. They're mm. every time they're fielding a ground ball, for the most part, I would say like seventy-five to eighty percent of the time they're throwing a, a ground, throwing a ball after they receive it. You know, so they're taking like full-on reps, and so they're constantly like just muscle memory of like building a forehand. I'm in this position. I'm in the backhand. I'm you know, I'm, I'm like reading a long hop. I'm in this position. So it's more about reps. Um, and that's the thing that I went, one of the things I shockingly, like I was hoping that I was going to learn like a lot of defensive drills. Honestly, they are not drill heavy. <laughs> and wow. I, like I said, interesting when I'm here, it's more about reps. Um, yeah. And then maybe every now and then they might like, you know, do like rolled ground balls and stuff like, but that's rare. Most of the time mm-hmm. they take ground balls, it's off, of, it's off of a bat and they're moving. Yeah. It's weird. <laughs> no, it, it makes that total sense. Good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it makes me want to like relook how I train too. Cause sometimes I get too caught up in the drills, you know, mm-hmm. and in reality, like you need to one, be able to functionally like move your body, but yeah. two, like, can you do it under pressure? Do they do a lot of like, um, like challenges and stuff? No, no, they just, they practice. don't. And that they might just be practice. just our team, but our team just is like purely reps, yeah. purely reps, purely practice not a lot of drills. And, um, I will say like what changes from day to day is the tempo of the fungo hitter or, or from our coach. Mm. So when she's doing like team defense, like she'll just like pick up the tempo. And like, so like literally like if 
you're the next person you got to be ready and like you got to get rid of the ball because it's getting hit hit to the next person like that's behind you so like the tempo happens so like that's how they're able to speed up the game Mm -hmm. I will say that the tempo of defense is a little bit faster generally than we are at home but they for the most part practice at that tempo regularly so um I think it helps that I mean their transitions their footwork getting rid of you know like all of those things are like all ingrained in the tempo and the speed of the fungo for that day. Um, and some days she'll do it slower where, you know, they, like they get to take her time, take a couple steps, re, you know, gather, separate and throw. Um, and it's, so it's, it, it's intentful in terms of the tempo. So they're like a drill that would be focusing on tempo or, you know, fast or slow. Um, it's kind of built into their rep practice, if that makes sense. It totally does. I love that. I love that. Some of my best coaches would do something similar. Like if we had a game coming up, most of our practice is just, just you get your reps in, just get your reps in reps, 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 because then like, once you play, it's a much easier to trust the work that you put in because you've done the work. Like you've put in thousands of reps this week on this and now it's just like, have fun and play. So Mm -hmm. you do, do they scrimmage? I know you mentioned they scrimmage, um, every once in a while. And I'm assuming this is their type of competition. It's like, okay, take what you just did in practice for the last five hours. Now let's put it into action with live pitchers and things like that. So do they do a lot of scrimmaging and stuff? Uh, I'm just curious over here. Yeah. I mean, uh, we play like in our preseason, we play a lot of practice game against other teams. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of like inner squad, it's very rare. Um, I mean, we do it. Um, and obviously like the intent would be like maybe more so for the pitchers or maybe more so for the hitters. Obviously I think it's, you know, who benefits is dual hitters and, and pitchers, but I, not as much as you would think. Um, mm-hmm. They are very rep oriented. It's like, that's the part that was like mind blowing. I'm like, we don't do any drills. Like we don't do any competitions. Like, oh my gosh. Like it's, you know, hard to stay motivated sometimes, but their motivation is purely mastering their skill sets and their wow. fundamentals and not a lot of time is spe- spent on like <laughs> challenges for their entertainment you know mm-hmm. <laughs> which is a big thing at home we're trying especially you know we all train kids and it's like trying to yeah. engage and keep, keep it fun excited. so creating these challenges but like they are so rep oriented um the way that they that's how they duplicate the game is by doing reps you know hitting off live, hitting front toss, hitting off of the machine, taking ground balls off of a, a fungo hitter or taking ground balls off of like a live hitter. You know, when we do have um, like live hitters, they, they will go and like they'll play at their positions and it's just like live reps. So mm-hmm. it's not a lot of broken down drills. It's, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I would, I mean, I came and I was wait, waiting to like have a piece of paper to take down all the drills. <laughs> And I'm like, just it's reps, it's reps every single day at a hundred percent game speed, game, like every day. But that's how you become good. Like that is how you become good. You know, it's <laughs> funny because when I worked in Notre Dame, I was talking to uh, Lizzie Ristano and she was like, I, I was doing a lot of, of drill or um, I was doing a lot of lessons at the time. And she was like, you should just like run little clinics. We're just like, you just give them a bunch of reps. I'm like, but that's not fun. Like, that's not fun. But she was like, but that's what everybody does in California. Like low key, like this is how they become good. Um, And Lizzie Lemire, shout out to her. Well, her maiden name is Lemire. Yes. We went to high high school together. Shut up. I did not know this. It's her birthday today, actually, as we're recording this. I think it is. I'm going to have to text her. I forgot. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I had no idea you went to high school together. Yes, that's Lizzie Lemire. That's Oh my gosh. My day one homie. Yes. That's amazing. That's amazing. But yeah, when she talked about it, I was just like, just a bunch of reps. Like, but when you think about it, the more you work on anything, the better you're going to get at it naturally. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. and I like how the, especially when you do fungo, it's like you, you're, you have to be attentive. You have to like move quickly because the game moves Mm -hmm. quickly, but Mm -hmm. it's like, it's also kind of like getting rid of your mistake, like get rid of your Mm -hmm. failure now. Like do you yep. make a mistake? Move on, make a mistake, yep. move on, make a yep. mistake, move on. Like yep. they're literally ingraining that with their training. Yep. Um, and that's the hard thing with softball. It's like, we're not like basketball or volleyball. We're like the game keeps going or when you're on yep. offense, you got to go play defense. There's no, there's right. no real breaks. 
No. Nope. Um, and in softball, there's too many, in my opinion. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's really interesting. And I know coaches right now are geeking out so hard. They're like, <laughs> oh, they- I know. And I feel horrible. I, I mean, I feel horrible because everybody like it, this is a very common question. And I, like I said, when I came, like I was so ready to just like have a notebook of like all the drills they do. Mm-hmm. They don't do drills. They just do reps. They just yeah. do reps. It's mind blowing. It's crazy. Yeah. Lizzie, Lizzie's going to love that answer. That's for <laughs> sure. Um, you know, I promised everybody we'd talk about base running for a minute. Um, maybe we should just talk about it for a second and then plan another episode where we dive really deep into it. I love so, that. so we give people a fun little um, thing to look forward to next time you're on. Cause yeah. I think, I feel like we could talk for 10 hours. Um, so let's just dive into how do, how do we make this brief? Like, that's the hard part. Cause <laughs> like, I don't, I was like, I was like, well, I'm thinking to myself, I, know. Like, I don't think we can make this brief. I don't think we can either. Let's just that. talk about the first step. Let's talk about the power of a powerful first step. Okay. And I think that's like, if, if anybody's just starting off with base running, getting really good at reacting and having a powerful first step where you gain the most ground. Mm-hmm that's going to like start the engine and get you rolling. Like no matter if you're leading off of a bag, whether you're, you just got a hit and you're running to first or Mm -hmm. even on defense, like reacting to a ball and moving. Yep. I think, I think a powerful first step is huge and you work with slappers. Like how powerful Mm -hmm. is the touch and go like being able to gain ground? How do, how do you work with some of your athletes on the first step or just gaining ground with the first step? Just to be able, I mean, in terms of slapping or, or base running, or I guess all the above, but yeah, uh, you could, you could, you could say slappers. Cause I feel like anything yeah. can be reiterated in some other form too. Yeah. I mean, especially with slappers. I mean, I, there's like, I'll break down like how we're getting out of the box after we make contact, you know, because it, it, it is the most common mistake is athletes are trying to vacate too soon, but it's all about being explosive and accelerating, like making sure you complete your contact first. Mm-hmm. And then acceleration happens, but it's also, you know, there's so many things, you know, obviously your, your timing is going to be a factor when you're slapping, you want to be gaining speed, you know, mm-hmm. you don't want to be stopping making contact and then having to pick back up. So it's like this gradual, you know, kind of like taking off as a plane, um, where you're gaining speed. Um, so I, I think we will, we'll start in like our crossover making contact and trying to be explosive. I'll either actually have them do their actual full steps we'll put cones down the first baseline and like seeing like your first three steps if you can try to um like you said gain and cover ground and so like we'll Mm -hmm. put a marker let's see if you can beat it you know the next time out so just trying to focus on like first three steps of like covering and gaining ground um yeah that i mean first that's mainly like one of i mean a drill that i would do with slappers um, mm-hmm. just in base running, just same thing, you know, those first, I think I always do the first three steps, you know, like yes. you want to accelerate the explosive, um, high, mean, yeah. yeah, think about track runners, you know, like, mm-hmm. I don't know, for so long, we always used to see the, um, rocker start for base runners, like on first base, like, why would you do that? Um, <laughs> right. Do you see the same bolt when he gets out the blocks? Do you see him like rocking back for back and then going first like he is like staying low to the ground as possible as low as possible shooting out covering ground trying to um pick up foot speed as fast as he possibly can so that he can lengthen out his strides you know and so right um, hitters do the same thing by the way like on their loads some of them are loading way too far Mm -hmm. they're not getting low to the ground like you were saying Mm -hmm. they're not using the floor Oh my gosh. Okay. So a lot of people have a lot to look forward to when we continue to talk about base running. That's for sure. One thing I just wanted to throw in there is like, if you, if you're not a slapper and like starting in your crossover, easy thing you could do is just, we'll work on the shin angle. Like basically, um, like where your leg and your feet meet, like you want to create like a 45 degree angle there. Um, but like even just doing like one knee down, like on the ground and just lean and shift your weight into like the ball of your foot where you're creating that angle. And then just like on a go trying to explode and get up, you're going to feel slow as molasses when you start doing that. But you know, um, it's something that, you know, just work, you know, five reps each side and then you're done. You don't have to, you don't have to overkill speed. Um, 10 minutes a day, like you can get so good at it. I like that. Yeah. I love it. 
Um, me too. I love base running. Um, okay. Before I ask you the quick five to thrive today, um, we, we talked a little bit about your foundation in the last episode. Um, we talked a little, we talked about slapping and like all the courses that you have there, but basically I know so many people are enlightened by your work, um, that I, I definitely want to give the listeners justice and, and kind of allow them to have an opportunity to, to see what you're doing, um, for them that they could, uh, jump in and join if, if it suits them, you know, and, and you know, precursor, we're probably going to do a base running course at some time, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but go ahead and, and take our there. there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what else I'm doing is that that was the question what I'm like I'm doing so much um uh you know I started a travel ball team this past year um you know it's obviously like right now it's I should I should say it's local in LA we have a team in Georgia as well um but that's more so I was looking for a way where having impact on the the whole entire game and I think the travel ball space is a a place where a lot of us don't go back to um, Mm -hmm. as retired athletes and just giving them that physical presence of a female who's played the game I've tried to recruit other coaches that want to stay in the game that can feel supported and still make an impact that way and so impacting like on all fronts on the field off the field and not just, you know, slapping in all the slapping stuff that I've done. Like, I love it, but I, you know, I felt like I was getting stuck of like not being able to, um, expand outside of that. And maybe that's yeah. my own, um, my own t- limitations that I put on myself. But I feel it too. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, starting the travel ball team, definitely I'm, you know, a, a totally a startup and um, there's a ton of competition in a sense of the teams that are out there Um, but it's been a fun experience of like knowing um, that that travel ball experience is such a important phase of every softball athlete's life of being able to be a part of that like I'm really looking forward to that Um, and so it's just you know keeping the impact in mind um, and helping develop these athletes, um, in a way that I, I, you know, I'm pretty confident uh, in in terms of the development part. Um, um, what else? I mean, I'm like, you know, I don't even know where to, I don't know. Like, I feel like I'm doing like so many different things, obviously, like, you know, I got the house flipping. That's, that's not probably in the soccer world that anybody probably wants to be a part of. Hey, I'm telling you the softball (laughs) world is enjoying looking at all of these transformations (laughs) on Instagram. It's been a blast to watch. Yeah. 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 So they can head to your website to see all the cool things that you're up to. And yes, between the foundation, obviously, you know, and I think during COVID times during the, uh, we were able to do more virtual stuff through the foundation, like low barrier costs, like free trainings. Um, so definitely go to my website. Um, a lot of slapping content and, you know, now if you're, uh, looking for, um, if you have a, a team and you're looking to plug into our travel ball team and it's called Watley crew, my travel ball organization would love to bring you on board. Um, I'd love working with coaches in terms of like helping them, um, with their practice plans, with them helping develop them. You know, I do have, I have a couple of dads in Georgia that have, have signed on as well. Um, but just trying to at least influence the coaches, the female coaches that I have on board to be able to be in front of those athletes as well. And, um, just help them with their coaching plans and helping them progress their athletes as much as possible. So if there's other travel ball teams, I would love to, to bring you on board. And, um, I think it's just a fun little journey, um, just to be able to share experiences and obviously like, you know, exactly what we're, we get to do every day, like why we love our job so much is like, we've been there before, you know, mm-hmm. and so just be able to, put that out there, share our experiences. I think it's pretty, it's pretty fun. Yeah. hundred percent agree. I will make sure that, uh, your, your, I almost said email, but your website is in the show notes. So if anybody wants to dive in and see, you know, if they want to do a travel team, look into the foundation, um, how cool was it that how, like, was it six athletes, limited athletes, they played for the foundation. Was it six? I think it was. You had definitely the most amount of athletes um, yeah, playing for you. Seven. And that part, you know what, Ashley, like that was like one of the coolest moments because, you know, building the foundation, it's been about community and 
just those athletes, like just raising their hand saying like, we support and we play for this initiative. Like it's, you know, it takes a village, so to speak. And like, just to, to have that community built in within the softball community with these athletes representing the foundation, like meant the world to me, because, that, you know, obviously the, the foundation is my baby, but it's more than just being my baby. It's about supporting our community in a, in, you know, there's a huge gap there. And that's obviously like, my passion project is like, you know, just bringing softball to any and every single young girl in the world that wants to play this game or doesn't even know that she wants to play this game yet. Right. you know, and so for them to, to raise their hand and, and do that, like it was huge. Yeah. Was huge. Yeah. I thought that was so fun to look at. Um, yeah. So definitely go check out our website, go see all the cool things that the foundation is doing, check out our travel team. I think that's, that's so exciting. Cause you didn't have that last, well, no, it, it was kind of just starting last time we talked. Yeah. Um, and yeah. And if anybody wants to learn more about the foundation, we talked a lot about, about it in the last episode. There's so much that people can learn from you already with these two, but let's dive into five to thrive questions. You ready? Yes. They're different than last time. They're much okay. different. Um, okay. This is the fun part. What's your favorite part of practicing in general? What's your favorite part of practice? Because I know the Japanese love practice. My favorite part of practice as an athlete or as a coach? Coach. My answer is different. As a coach, I mean, that's easy. Like seeing an athlete get it, you know? And I think uh, anytime you can see an athlete progress and like when they are starting something and like the doubts there, but that feeling of a coach of like, hey, like I have confidence in you. Um, empowering an athlete and then just seeing them gradually get better. Like there's no, there's no better feeling. Like that's addicting um, in terms of just um, seeing them get, seeing, seeing the athlete get it. Totally. Now you got to answer it as a player because I'm interested. As a player, I mean, I think it's the, what I love about practice is the confidence building, you know, because you, you do see you're, you're failing probably more times than not. And so what I love about practice is like the confidence it feeds me because then, you know, there are moments when I do get it right. And I'm like, I can do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can do it, but how can I get more consistent at doing it? And so, um, I think that confidence is what feeds you when it comes game day, or it's like, okay, like the three out of 10 times I did get it right in, in practice, you know? So like, I'm confident that I can do it. Um, so how can I repeat that when it comes game day? So different feeling. It's like just a confidence that it's embedded in you um, in practice. That's why I love practice. Yeah. And then you have a coach who gives you a high five because they see you get yeah. it. And then all yes. of a sudden it's like you're thirsty for more. Exactly. Wow. I think, I think coaches, parents, we all can learn from that answer. Um, what is one thing that no matter what you should be doing every practice? Like just if it was, if you could choose one thing that Ooh. people have to do. Ooh, um, I, I think every hitter should be doing one arms, whether you're a slapper or a mm. hitter, I think you should be doing one arms. And I don't know if that's kind of what your question means, but like, I think like yes. one arms, Yep. I'm a big fan of like one arms off of the T. Um, a lot of people would disagree with me, but like just knowing your hand path, knowing your mechanics, the, um, it's muscle memory. Uh, you need to know how your bat flows, how it moves. Yeah. Shout out to Scott Burkhart. That's all we did when I was <laughs> growing up. We did that because I had like a weaker arm, my left uh -huh. arm. Yeah. And dad was just like, okay, how do we do it? He probably got this from like Sue Inquist in a video or something. And you were the model, but yeah, my dad and I did so much of that. And I can attest to that. Like talk about, you know, body awareness that, mm -hmm. that in itself, just doing one arm work is huge. Yeah. We would start off the T and then do front toss. Yeah. I feel that to my core. Yeah. And it's yep. scary as heck the first time you do it, but the more you do it, the easier it gets. Good answer. Um, what's the best base running advice you've ever been given? Ooh, um, best base running advice I've ever been given. Um, 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 uh, gosh, I mean, I would say like more so trust your instincts mm. and, uh, uh, gosh, I'm trying to think, um, I, like I think that. it's more just like trusting your instincts and like trusting yourself because I do remember there was a moment where I was looking at like my third base coach, like, should I come? Should I not go? Do I tag? Do I not? 
you know, just trust your instincts. Like you read it for yourself. I'm here to be your aid and to give you, you know, touch up, you know, or touch up. That's how they say in J J Japan is touch up, mm -hmm. but tag, you know, tag up, you know, you're going to tag, but it's up to you on um, whether you go instinctually, like, you know, your speed, you know, you, you know, kind of read the, read the play for yourself. Yeah. And don't be afraid to make mistakes to, while, while you're trusting it. Cause yeah. You're not always going to be right, but yeah. that's how you learn. Good answer. Yeah. yeah. I love it. What's your favorite food in Japan? Oh gosh. So many. That's honestly the reason why I keep coming back. Ashley, it's not awful. <laughs> it's the food. Oh, there's so much. My favorite currently is called Nabe and it's like a soupish thing, but it's got meat, tofu, veggies, it's almost like shabu shabu if you're familiar with shabu shabu um where you I'm like not, put, i should be um, meat in um hot boiling water and like you're supposed to say shabu shabu and like because it's like thin slices of meat and it cooks okay um but nabe is a different version of that it's like a broth based meat dish and it's delicious yeah and i just learned how to cook it so it's good sign so, me up called, let's go nabe. i need to go it's to japan nabe. Uh, yeah. but before I ask the final question, I need to thank you once again for coming on, um, and for, you know, slyly saying that you'll come back on and talk about base running <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> because I feel like there's just so many things that we could just explode and talk about. Um, but thank you again for what you do. Like the fact that you're just trying all these new things to help the game grow. Um, you're doing incredible work and I've been able to see it from the sidelines and just keep it up. I'm excited to have you as a mentor in this game and learn how you're doing it too. So mad appreciation. You, you're doing awesome things too. It's been fun to see the impact that you've been making. So I appreciate you and thank you for your time as well. Thank this you. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Final question. What's your favorite Japanese tradition that we don't know about? Mm. My favorite Japanese tradition God, they be have, anything. Like, I know they do so much. <laughs> I mean, I think they're such a ritual based culture. I mean, and it's hard to say like what my favorite is, but I think it's, uh, I wouldn't call it my favorite, but I think the thing that I've grown to love, which when I first came, I probably was like, this is so weird, but every day, before we start practice, we literally like bow to the field. <laughs> and so like as a team, so we stand on the line, I can send you pictures, but like literally like, you know, before we start practice, they bow to the field and it's like, thank you for the opportunity. And it's almost like, it seems like it's like religious. And I'm like, are they forcing like their religion on us? Like this, you know, I was just like, so, yeah. you know, like, what is this about? You know, but I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, like I said, I'm going to be open-minded. I'm going to, I'm going to take it on. Um, but you know, it's what you make of it. In my opinion, it's like, thank, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this chance to play, to get better. Um, you know, like make us, make sure we're all good today, that we're healthy, that we have a good practice. We're doing that. And we're in this together. We're all doing Like we're all bowing together. Um, it's just a show of, um, it's just showing graciousness and, um, thankfulness in my opinion. So, I, I like when we, I, I wouldn't, I don't, I, I can't, it's hard to say that it's my favorite. It's the thing that's grown on me the most um, before we start practice each day, that bow to the field. Wow. There's a lot we can learn from, from them. Yeah. Wow. Yes. And there's so much more that I want to ask, but thank you so much for coming on Tosh. This was, this was a blast. I, I didn't think it could get better than the first episode, but it totally <laughs> did. No, it totally did. So I'm talking to you and talking to the game and Thank you for having me. Feelings mutual. Thanks, Tosh.